Today I want to talk to you about Elisha. You know, we hear a lot about these are the days of Elijah. But Elisha was one of the double portion prophets. And uh, he speaks much about the end of this age. His life is a picture of much of the end, these end times. We are living in the days of Elijah. But so we are living in the days also of Elisha. We don't hear much about Elisha, but as I said, he was the double portion prophet. He was a picture of who we are in Christ. He was a type of Christ. You know, he raised the dead, multiplied food, purified water. When he died, he was laid in a cave or a sepulchre, and his body still retained life. You know, because they said there was a battle going on and one of the soldiers was killed and so they threw the soldier's body into the cave where Elijah lay, was dead. And when this guy touched Elijah, he was raised from the dead, he came back to life. Now all that was still in his body, you see. And Elijah came, it says, to Gilgal. And there was a dearth in the land. This is... 2 Kings 4, 38. And there was a dearth in the land, and the sons of the prophets were sitting before him. And he said to his servants, Set on a great pot of pottage for the sons of the prophets. So they went out into the field to gather herbs, and they found a wild vine and gathered of the wild gourds. And until his lap was full, they came back, shredded them, uh, into the pot of the pottage, for they knew them not. So, they boiled this stuff up, they poured it out for the men to eat, and it came to pass that when they were eating of the pottage, they cried out and said, O oh, man of God, there is death in the pot. And they couldn't eat thereof. Well, Elisha said, but bring me a meal. And they cast it into the pot, and he said, pour it out for the people that they might eat it. And there was no harm in the pot. Now it's very important, significant for these end times. You know, he purified water. He dealt with poison in the food. Doesn't this speak familiar of these last days? You know, it tells us in Revelation chapter 8, and the second angel sounded, verse 8 and chapter 8, and it was a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea came polluted, blood or polluted. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea that had life died, and a third part of all the ships who were in that part of the sea, were destroyed. And a third angel sounded, and there fell its great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell into the third part of the rivers and the fountains of life. Okay, what was this coming in? Um, you know, and the name, it says, of this star is called Wormwood. It's just very interesting. For, remember in Chernobyl when that uh, nuclear power station exploded? It was, it was in a place and it was called Wormwood. Okay. But something hit the oceans coming in from asteroid or whatever. Hit the oceans and a third of the oceans were polluted. They couldn't drink it. Couldn't use it for anything. Third of the sea, the rivers, and so on were polluted. You know, it's interesting that the Pacific Ocean takes up a third of all the land, of all the seas in the world. All of the oceans, the Pacific Ocean composes of a third of them. And uh, so, it's a third of the seas. We're reaching, this is a future thing. Third of the rivers are polluted. Third of the water, fresh water systems are polluted. A third of the seas are polluted. Killed the fish. 
No. And Elisha said unto her, you see, it's interesting. Now we come to 2 Kings 4.2. And Elisha said unto her, what shall I do for you? Tell me. She said, what do you have in the house? And she said, your handmaid had nothing in the house save a pot of oil. Okay. Then he said, go borrow, borrow vessels abroad of all your neighbors, even empty vessels, and borrow not a few. And when you come, they shall shut the door upon thee, and upon thy sons pour out the oil into the vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons. We brought the vessels to her. She poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said, Her sons, bring me yet a vessel. And he said, There are no vessels left. And the oil stopped. So what is this telling us? You know, there's coming a tremendous time, a shortage of food. Um, supermarkets will be closed. You know, refrigeration systems will be shut down. And um, we're going to see some of these things happening in the world. There will be great earthquakes, shortages of food, and so on. And it says, you know, here, go to your neighbors and get some vessels from them. It's interesting going to your neighbor. You know, we need to prepare for what is coming. There's going to be shortages on every front. But here you see, Elisha just told the spoke the word, and there was a multiplication of food, or oil, food, whatever you want to call it. It multiplied until they ran out of vessels. Okay. The difficult times that lay ahead of us, you're going to have to take care of your neighbors. That's part of the gospel of the kingdom, blessing your neighbors. And yes, we need to prepare for that. We can store, you know, store food and all that. Now that's important. We need to have the power to purify water. This is the powers of the age to come available to us now in these last days. Very interesting. Some of the new churches need to start to get build way up, acquire warehouses and start to stock them with food that will not go off and i tell you the more you give it away to those around you you'll find the next day it's being restocked by god and so it will continue on this is part of the gospel of the kingdom this is what the kingdom is like we need to show what the kingdom of god is like in this earth you have a responsibility to your neighbors Think about it. You know, we need insight, foresight. We need insight, but we need foresight and how to prepare. This were the days. This was the time of Elisha, the double portion prophet, the days on which we are now coming into, the double portion. In Second Kings chapter 4 and verse 34, it says, um, uh, verse 17 it says and the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elijah had said to her according to the time of life and when the child was grown it fell on a day that he went out to his father to the reapers and he said unto his father my head my head my head and he said to the lad carry him home to his mother and when he had taken him he brought him to his mother and sat her upon his knees and he died and she went up and laid him on the bed of a man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. Now, it's interesting. This child dies, okay? So she goes to find a man of God. Who did she go to? Somebody who knows the Lord. That's like you. Somebody who knows the Lord. This could be your neighbor. And so, and when Elijah came to the house, behold, the child was dead. And he went in, therefore, shut the door upon them, and prayed to the Lord. He put his eyes upon his eyes, his hands upon his hands, stretched himself upon the child, and the child's flesh became warm. The child 
was raised from the dead. These are not just the days of Elijah. They're also the days of Elisha. You know, he was so full of life that even after his death, somebody touched him and came back to life. Elisha's name is derived from a root um, Hebrew word that means the mighty or almighty, especially the almighty God. This is the almighty God at work in these last days through his people. So what kind of a guy was Elisha? Well, first, we need to look at the fact that he was ploughing his field when he was, Elijah called him, he was ploughing a field with 12 yoke of oxen. Now that is a bit, you know, over the top, 12 yoke of oxen. Usually it was four. Six was a bit over doing it, 12. And he parted then, it says in First Kings 19 and 19, so he departed then and found Elisha ploughing with 12, <clears throat> 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he with the 12th, and Elijah passed by him, cast his mantle on him. Why did he choose Elisha? He saw him plowing. This guy's a bit nuts, you know, 12 yoke of oxen. You don't need 12 yoke of oxen to plow a field. So he left the, he cast his mantle upon him. He left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said unto him, go back again, for what I have, what, for what have I done to you? Go away. He returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them, all their flesh, with the instruments of the oxen, and he gave it to the people, and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered to him. It's very interesting, you know. Elijah's didn't know this guy, walking through, walking down the road, sees this guy plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, casts his mantle on them. Obviously, Elisha felt something, and um, he said, I want to follow you, I want to come after you. Um, and so he went home, he cut all of his ties to follow this man. He killed the oxen, he ate them, It's interesting. So he's following Elijah. So he's now he's coming, walking with Elijah. And Elijah said unto him in 2 Kings 2 4, You wait here, I pray you, for the Lord is sending me on to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth and as your soul liveth, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. You see, once you've set your heart on something, you've got to go for it. There will be what I call divine discouragement, things that discourage you, but you've got to keep going. Elisha kept going. He said, I'm not going to leave you. I started on this journey. I'm going to see it through. You touch me with your mantle and something, there's something in my future. You know, it's easy to settle for the status quo. Very easy. You know, go through life. We settle that way. It says, and the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho in 2 Kings 2, 5, came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away your master from thy head today? So, these sons of the prophets came and said to Elisha, you're going to lose your master anyway. I don't know why you're following him. Are you going to take your master away from your head today? And he answered, yes, I know. You lot hold your peace. The, these sons of the prophets of the Bible said, just looked on and were watching. They didn't get involved. They were just watching. Three times, Elijah tried to dissuade Elisha from following him. You know, but Elisha had a different, he was a different kind of guy. 12 yoke of oxen, he was really a go-getter, you know. 
He said, I'm, not, I'm going to follow you all the way. You can't stay, tell me to stay here. I will not leave you, he said. But it then says, it goes on to say in 2 Kings 2, 7, 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood afar off. And they stood by Jordan. It's interesting, 50 sons of the prophets. 50 is the number of what? Pentecost. We all know that. Okay, so these Pentecostal sons of the prophets were watching afar off what they weren't getting involved. And Elijah took his mantle, in 2 Kings 2, 8, and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and hither, so they went over a dry ground. And it came to pass, when they were gone over, Elijah said to Elisha, ask what you will do. What do you want before I'm going to be taken away? What do you want? And Elisha said, I want a double portion. I want twice as much of you, God. That's the kind of people God is looking for today. We want twice as much as we've seen in the past. This is a new day. Twice as much. I want a double portion of your spirit upon me. And so Elijah said, well... He have asked for a hard thing. Nevertheless, and he said this weird thing now, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so unto you, but if not, it shall not be so. And Elisha's thinking now, okay, say that again. If I see you when you're taken up, it, you can have what you have asked for. But if you don't see me taken up, you can't have it. Well, what's that about? Fifty sons of the prophets, they were Pentecostal, looking on. But Elisha represented a new day. You see, we're moving on from Pentecost. We're moving on. And a lot of Pentecostals are looking on. They said, oh, we'll see. They looked on. What was that about? He said, if you see me when I'm gone, you can have this. I, I puzzled about this for many a long, long time, and I cried of the Lord, asked the Lord. Eventually, he spoke to me about it. He said, if you see the passing of the old, only if you see the passing of the old can you enter into the new. The... There are millions of Pentecostals who don't understand the days in which we are living right now. They don't understand it. We're coming to the end of an era. We're moving on from Pentecost to number 50. We're moving on to the Feast of Tabernacles, a new day, and the powers of the age to come, and everything that goes with that. The church age, now listen to me, the church age is beginning to fade out to make room for the kingdom age. Now you need to think about that, ponder it. The church age is moving out, it's fading out to make room for the kingdom age. The kingdom age is now dawning. It is a time when what the kingdom is and what it represents will be brought to this earth. This will be accompanied by a great shaking and when it's over, only that which is of God will remain. The tears will be removed, particularly the structures of the church today will be removed. See, the, the history of the church can be understood as rising and falling, a move of God, falling, a move of God, falling. We've seen this through the years. But there's a shaking. We, over, we are now overdue for a massive shaking. A massive earthquake, as it were, that the church has never seen before. And when this is over, oh, the tears will be removed. And what remains, the old church age will disappear altogether. And what remains will be the kingdom of God. That one more time. You know, Paul said that God's saying in Hebrew 12, one more time I will shake the heavens and the earth. That one more time is now upon us. 
Well, we'll see it in the natural world with great earthquakes. We really will. And particularly massive tsunamis. But that's the picture of what's happening in the spiritual realm. The pressure is building for a spiritual earthquake. Major shock waves are on the way. Birth pangs have taken hold of the church. Contractions are getting closer and closer. It's time to move on. You've got to be like Elisha. You've got to take hold of that which you see. You've got to have the drive. You've got to have the determination. You're not going to be left behind. You're going to move on into this double portion age. You're going to move on into the realm of the powers of the age to come. This is your generation. You're here and alive for this. Closing with this now. Many years ago, I was looking out over the Indian Ocean and uh, one day in Western Australia and uh, I saw on the horizon, it was a very, it was early in the morning, but it was warm and fine, very few people on the beach. Now I was walking along the beach, literally walking along the beach and I saw a wave way out on the horizon, a large wave and I wondered about this. Um, and. Uh, so I stopped and I turned to look at it. And when I looked at it, I was in the spirit. And I watched this wave come up over the beach. And in this wave, there were multitudes of people. I could see them, multitudes of people. Um, and with a huge sound and roar, it swept over me in, and went inland and caused disruption in, in so many places. I saw some buildings which were government buildings totally collapsed. I saw churches, many churches just collapsed. I saw um, people, these people in this wave, I understood were new Christians. And a great shaking had occurred somewhere out at sea, or an earthquake out at sea, which had caused this tsunami wave to come in, but it was carrying a harvest of new Christians. It seemed like it was chaos, there was no structure. I saw men and women, young people, arise out of this chaos. Um, it's hard to explain. And I saw another group of people, there was a rise of the apostolic ministry and they were teaching. This new, these new people have been swept in land with this wave. And I, I saw the curriculum and I wrote it down. As soon as I came out of this, the curriculum was one, how to have a relationship with the Lord. Curriculum two was how to hear the voice of God. Curriculum three was how to know, how to know God and know their destiny. Four was a little different, which I didn't fully understand, it was how to become soldiers of the cross. I kept looking at this, how to walk with God in purity and holiness. And then finally, the last thing on this curriculum was how to walk in the powers of the age to come. And I was just looking at this the other day through some old notes, which I wrote down this years ago when I had this. And, um, you know, we're living in a time in history that somebody statistics, work these st statistics out that in a, in, in a time of, we're living in a time of history where there are more people alive on this planet now than all the people who lived from Adam until 1984. All the people who lived and died from Adam all the way through that time to 1984, there are more people on planet Earth today than all those people who lived and died through those ages. So, you know, not has God given us the best wine at the end. We're going to have the greatest harvest when there's more people on the Earth, billions, and this rising up to seven billion on the Earth than ever before. And God is going to scoop the pool it's not only the days of Elijah, 
It is also the days of Elisha, a double portion. The latter rain was seven times greater than the former rain. Elisha was, a de was determined to get that double portion. How determined are you? How are you pressing in? Raise the dead, multiplied, multiplied food, purified water, moved in the powers of the age to come. His body was so full of life that the, the so dead soldier that touched him was brought back to life. Transfiguration as part of this end times availability, eating of the tree of life. You must choose to move on. It's not just drifting. You must choose. Make a choice. God requires for you to make a choice. You're going to move on into the new. You're moving beyond Pentecost. You're moving on into the powers of the kingdom of God made manifest in the earth in these times. God bless you.